study, we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 6. We looked at verses 1 through 10, verses 1 through 10. In verses 1 and 2, it dealt with masters and servants. Masters and servants, today we call them employers and employees. And so Paul tells the church in Ephesus, you and I who are believers in Christ, who are employees or employers, he says in verse 1, let as many bond servants, that's employees, as are under the yoke, count their own masters, that's the employers, boss, supervisors, worthy of all honor, not some honor, all honor. Why? So that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemy. You need to show a good testimony at work. Then we looked at verses 3 to 5, verses 3 to 5, and it dealt with false teachers. And this is what Paul does in all his epistles. Why? Because there will always be false teachers. And in verse 3, I want to point that one out. It says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome word, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which according with his godliness, he is proud, knowing absolutely nothing. That's how it is in the Greek. But what does he say in verse 5? He says, from such, withdraw yourself. When you come across false prophets, false teachers who are teaching doctrines outside of Scripture, not even quoting from Jesus. In the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul says, withdraw yourself from that person. Run away. Run away. They have nothing good to say. They're not teaching the Word of God. Then we looked at verses 6 to 10. It talks about true contentment. Um, he says in verse 6 and 7, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. T false teachers were teaching something opposite. Name it, claim it, shake it and bake it, blab it and grab it. Prosperity teachers, you know, the ones that are on TV, you know. Um, he, says, he says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. So as a believer in Jesus Christ, the things that we ought to be content with is clothing and food. That's all you need to survive. And let me tell you, in America, I think we don't have a problem with that. Okay? We need to be content with these things. Now, that brings us to the end, the closing of Paul's first letter to Timothy. And in chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 11 through 21. And so let us read the passage before us in verses 11 through 21. Paul writes in verse 11, he says this, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless unto our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and the only potate, the king of kings and lord of lords, who also has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation from the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of, which, of what is falsely called knowledge by professing it. Some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you and all God's people say, Amen. Amen.
We now come to verses 11 to 21 of 1 Timothy chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul, again, he's closing his letter. He's giving Timothy his final instructions, final instructions to Timothy as a pastor, but also 1 Timothy is a letter for pastors, elders, deacons, and also uh, the church, all of us. But we see that all that Paul has encouraged Timothy, it's also applicable for us as believers in Jesus Christ. But it's expected and it's required for a leader in the house of God. And so we're going to break this down in verses 11 through 16. Verses 11 through 16, Paul commands uh, Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. And in verses 17 through 19, Paul commands the, those who are wealthy in the church uh, to, you know, he's going to give a commandment. And believe it or not, there are wealthy people in church. In verses 20 to 21, Paul will end his letter with a warning to guard the faith. Guard the faith, the faith I'm sorry, in verses 20 and 21. Well, we read our text. Let us now study it verse by verse. Let's look at verse 11. Verse 11, Paul begins by saying, But you, O man of God. But you, O man of God. Paul is, 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 now turns his attention directly to Pastor Timothy. Timothy is a young man. He's a young pastor in the church. He's now addressing him directly. He said, But you, but you, Timothy. But you, uh, and, and in contrast to what he has spoken back in verses 3 through 5. In verses 3 to 5, uh, he's addressing the false teachers, you remember. Now, but you, you're not a false teacher, but you, Timothy, O man of God. Now, the title is interesting, man of God. Uh, it, was, it was often used, that title was used in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was used, as a matter of fact, 76 times, man of God. Man of God, pointing to the prophets or those who, were God, who had God-like behavior. So man of God is mentioned 76 times, uh, including to describe a great man of God like Moses, Elijah, and also Samuel, just to name a few. They were called man of God. Now there is an opposite of a man of God we find in the scriptures. And that is the man of sin. The man of sin. You've heard. Who's the man of sin? The Antichrist. We see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, where it says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That's speaking of a time after the rapture of the church, when the church is no longer here, the great tribulation, the judgment of God begins and the Antichrist will be revealed. He's called the man of sin. And so, again, although this letter is addressed to leaders and pastors, elders, and a pastor like Timothy, and for pastors today, it is applicable for us. And I know that you know, even though Paul mentions man of God here, you find it, it's only mentioned twice in the New Testament. Man of God is only mentioned twice, 76 times in the Old Testament, twice in the New Testament here, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, and the second time, he uses, uh, uses the, the, the term, the title, man of God, a little bit freely. It's not only speaking to a man, speaking of a you know, man, but it's speaking men, humanity in general. How do we know that? Well, when the second time that it appears, the title, is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. And this is what Paul wrote. He said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And, this, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That here it is, the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now we know this is used freely because this applies to every single one of us. We depend on the scriptures of God and we believe that is inspired by God. Written by man, but we know is inspired by God. How do we know that? Well, because the Bible, it, it com complements each other. All the, the 66, 66 books and 40 authors, many of them never met each other, uh, written by, by shepherds, kings, and prophets. 
um, and they're consistent in the word of God. The word of God is without error. This is how we know it's inspired. We believe that. You believe that. That is why you're here this morning. And so, saints, we are all called to be godly people with, with God-like character, to be Christ-like. And so we are all called to be a man and a woman of God. We're getting far, aren't we? We're still in verse 11. But you, O man of God, he says, flee these things. Flee from what, Paul? Flee from the false teachers, the false teachers and their false doctrines. He spoke that back in verses 3 to 5. False teachers who are lovers of money, teaching godliness is the means of gain. That is opposite of what God teaches. And so Paul said at the end of verse 5, from such withdraw yourself, here he says, flee from these things. So he says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue. You're going to run for something. I want you to flee from false prophets. Flee from false teachers. Flee from false doctrine. But I want you to pursue these things. And Paul's going to list six virtues, six things we are to pursue. And that applies for every single one of us. Number one, pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, right, it's not speaking of your righteousness because the scripture says there's none who is righteous. And that's in Romans chapter 3 verse 10 where Paul writes, It is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Neither, no one is righteous. But when we come to Christ, when we come to Jesus Christ, he closes that person with his righteousness. So every one of us, positionally, we are righteous. But you look at each other and you say, this person is not righteous. No, practically we're not. But, you know, when we accept Christ as Lord, a person, a Savior, you're considered complete in Christ. Again, positionally, because who you are in Christ, because of Christ. Practically, okay, you, you, you're working to be complete by the Holy Spirit. We're being renewed day by day, the scripture tells us. And so you and I, when we came to Christ, he clothed us with righteousness. Look what the prophet Isaiah said. Isaiah said in, six, in chapter 61, verse 10, he says, For he has clothed, speaking of Christ, he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. That is what God does when we come to him. When we come to him, you may say, well, I'm a mess. Yes, so am I. No one is righteous. No, not one. The scripture says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Even the best that you can do is considered filthy rags. But because of who we are in Christ, righteous. But here is not talking about that righteousness, the righteousness that's imputed into us at salvation. It is talking about holy life, to live a holy life. Be righteous. In other words, the man and woman of God is known for doing what is right, biblically right. So the man of God and the woman of God are to pursue righteousness, number one. Second thing we are to pursue is godliness. While righteousness looks at the outward behavior, you know, we could see someone of their being righteous, if you will. We don't know their heart. Only God knows their heart. But technically, we do know their heart because the Bible says the heart is corrupt, who can know it? And people say, well, you don't know my heart. I know your heart. It's just like my heart. It's corrupt. Who can know it? Yes, we have Christ, but it's being renewed day by day. The heart is wicked. That's why, you know, the, 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 Jesus says that the, 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 the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And it's something we need to work at every day. Righteousness deals with the outward behavior, while godliness deals with the inward, the attitude, the motives. You see, God knows the motives. God knows the motive of everyone's heart. Yeah, I may not know, according to the scriptures, yes, your heart is corrupted, but I don't know your motives. We don't know each other's motives. That's why we need to be careful not to judge. That's why Jesus said, hey, you know, before you judge, take that speck, you know, that telephone pole out of your eye. Before you judge someone else. Okay, and it's a judgment, of, you know, beginning of judgment of fruit. You know, people, there is a judgment, which is a righteous judgment. So people say, oh, you shouldn't judge. No, there is a judgment unto righteousness. It's a righteous judgment. But don't judge in the sense of condemning that person, that what, judging them by what they did, they're going to hell for that. That is a bad judgment. Judgment unto condemnation is what Jesus is talking about. 
And we need to realize that when we start judging, you know, that, hey, the, the stones are going to drop. He's going to ask everyone, as he did the Pharisees back then, when the woman that was brought before him, uh, he without sin cast the first stone. See, sin looks better okay when you do it. It doesn't look good when somebody else does, does it. We need to be careful. So the motives, but we need to be godly. And the motive, God, the godly motives we should have in the heart. So a man and woman of God are to pursue righteousness and godliness. And the third thing they are to uh, pursue is faith. Faith. And it, it's, it's speaking of us being faithful. Faithful. And, and, and having faith in God. Trusting in him in everything. It sets an example to the world. Because quite often... You know, we, 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 you could easily encourage somebody, you know, you need to have faith. How many times we needed to have faith? It's, we need to pursue faith. We need to trust in God in not some of the things, but all things. All things. The next thing we're to pursue is love. And the love here is the agape love. Agape is an unconditional sacrificial love. And a sacrificial love, if, if, if it is to consider others and forsake yourself. It is to love and to seek and to give and not to gain. Unconditional love. It's not I love you because or if or maybe or when. It's I love you, period. That's unconditional love. And that's the love it's talking about here. It's not a like. It's a love, unconditional love. The fifth thing we are to pursue is patience or perseverance, endurance. We need to pursue this in our walk with the Lord. Because how, how often we fall short, how often we fail, how often we grow cold. And we have no interest in the things of God anymore. We have no interest. Patience that enables the man and woman of God to stay the course, sticking it, sticking, sticking it, sticking to it when the going gets tough, no matter the cost. Patience. And then six and finally, gentleness. Uh, gentleness. Uh, another word for gentleness, if you're looking in the Greek, is, is really meekness. And meekness does not mean weakness. And Moses was called uh, the meekest man on earth, but he was by far to be weak. If he killed another Egyptian and to lead two and a half million people, I find it hard to, 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 to lead 12 people. Two and a half million people, he's not a meek man. I mean, weak man. He is meek, but not weak. Meekness means power under control. Power under control. And so now, these virtues that we just read here, uh, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and, and, and gentleness, are, are really, they're not valued in the world. The world doesn't care about this. But they're valuable to God. Especially to the man and woman of God. If you consider yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, these are the things we ought to pursue. So it's not only for leaders. It's not only for pastors, for each and every one of us. Now in verse 12, Paul says, in verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on the eternal life. Now, a man and a woman of God, we are to fight the good fight of faith. And Paul is not promoting violence here. He's not speaking of a physical fight. But obviously there's a spiritual fight. We forget that there is a fight spiritually. We forget that we need to build ourselves strong spiritually in order to be, be able to fight spiritually. That's a come quite often we lose because we're not, we're not uh, seeking the Lord. We're not spending time in devotion. We're not spending time in his word and in prayer. So we get weak. He's not talking about a physical carnal fight, but a spiritual one. Now, the first word for fight, you see fight mentioned twice here, fight, the good fight of faith. The first word for fight here is slightly different than the second. And the word here in the Greek is agonazomai. Agonazomai, and it means, we can almost say it in English, agonize. Agonize is to contend, to struggle with agony, difficulties, and danger. And that's the kind of fight we're to have spiritually, spiritually, okay? I don't want you to leave church and say, hey, Pastor Eddie said we're to fight. <laughs> Many times, there are a lot of false teachers, 
cults that would take the word of God out of context and not understanding what it's speaking of. I came across a man who, you know, I was introduced at a, at a, at a neighbor's house. They had a little celebration for their family, for a family member, and he was supposed to be some kind of leader of a church. I don't know what kind of church, but he said, you're a pastor? Yeah. And he says, are you preparing your congregation? Oh, every day. I said, no, no, there's going to be a war. There's going to be a battle. And I said, oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> and um, he said, yeah, I'm looking for property. And no, when the war comes, remind your people it's not the first war. It's the second war. Be ready. And that's why I'm getting ready. I'm, I'm getting all my ammo and everything. I said, oh, boy, here we go. Jesus said, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. <laughs> Our battle is not with flesh and blood. Even the battles and the wars that we find in Scripture, especially in the, Old, in, in the New Testament, it talks about in the end times, we're not fighting. I don't know if you, if, if you read your Bible well and you study Revelation, it says, and the armies of God clothed in white linen are coming in white horses, right? And, you know, I like what John Corson calls it. He says, the bride of Christ is the bride in combat boots. The church, we're coming with Christ, but we're not going to do a thing. We're just going to stand on a white horse looking pretty. And if you don't know how to ride a horse, that day you will, I promise you. And you're gonna, we're going to come in that battle. We, Christ is going to, just by his word, the very word that said light be, create, created light, created heaven, created the earth, is the very light that's going to destroy everything. He doesn't need our help. And so this battle here is a fight for the faith. This is a fight. It's a spiritual fight. And men and women of God, people of God, uh, we're going to go through some difficult times, and it's going to cause agony. It's going to cause uh, some kind of suffer, uh, pain and, and, and struggle. But we must fight the good fight of faith. It's a spiritual one. It's not a fleshly one. It's not a cardinal one. And this is what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So saints, we're to fight. And what are we fighting for? We're fighting for the eternal. It's not for the temporal. We fight here on earth. It's for the things here on earth that would perish and fade away. When we fight, we fight for the eternal. We're fighting uh, because we're focusing on heaven. We're heavenly bounded. And so it's a spiritual fight. And that's what we ought to fight. Stay the course. Pursue the things that Paul said. Pursue righteousness, godliness, love, faith. Pursue these things. And there is a battle. It's a spiritual battle. Good news is that when we do fight and we do have a battle, that God is fighting for us and he's fighting with us. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty in God from pulling down strongholds. Romans chapter 8, verse 37, he says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors in Christ, but more than conquerors through who? Myself? No. Through the government's military? No. Through him, Jesus Christ, who loved us. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You remember when God called you. That's when you came to the cross and you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. When did he call you? In fact, the scripture said he called you from the foundation of the earth even before you were born. He called you. Even before you, you, were, you were born, he called you from the foundation when he laid the foundation of the heaven and earth. And it says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, just as he, speaking of Christ, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? Holy and without blame before him in love. And when he called us, we, we came to the cross and we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. It is there that we made a confession. We get, made a good confession. And so, and we did it before uh, the Lord, and most importantly. But then we had, uh, we had our uh, family and friends who were with us. They were with us. And they witnessed uh, us coming to Christ. So it's a fight. Fight the good fight 
of faith. Verse 13, he said, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Before Pontius Pilate, you remember uh, the time when the Roman governor, uh, Pontius Pilate, um, uh, asked Jesus the question, and we find that in John chapter 18, verse 37, and, and Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth, Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So we have an example of what it is to make that good confession. And the greatest example, the ultimate example is Jesus Christ. And he says, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, verse 14, he says that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, unto the Lord Jesus Christ appearing. So we're to remain faithful, keeping the commandment, not the commandment Paul is referring to. If we read it in context, he is referring to the commandment to stay away from false teachers in verses 3 to 5 of chapter 6. When it comes to false teachers, what does he say? From such withdraw yourself. Withdraw. You don't have to defend God. You know, there are people that think they have all the answers. If you have all the answers, what do I need to talk to you for? Why am I wasting my time? You share the gospel and you bring correction. Sometimes they don't want to accept the correction. Those are the people you just stay away. And so keep this commandment. Remain faithful. Keep the commandment of Christ appearing. So we're to stay focused and, and, and on the return of Christ, which is not temporal, which is eternal. His, his appearing is soon and very, very soon. We're just one year closer to the return of Christ. And we see that we've been morally bankrupt for decades. And it just keeps going. And we see how people are being destroyed. Families are being divided. Churches are being divided. Why? Because we're, we're watching the world. Our eyes are on the world, not on Jesus. Our eyes are on parties, political parties. We look at the left, we look at the right. Christ wants us to look up. We're divided, and now we become medical experts. And, and, and that's bringing a division. There's nothing new. I, read, I look at the articles, nothing new, nothing new, nothing new. It's all the same thing. I'm not wasting my time. I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus Christ. Christ's eminent return should motivate us to be without spot, to be blameless, and living a godly life. But we can't. Why? Because we fill ourselves with junk. <laughs> Social media, the news. There's nothing new in the news. They should take out the word new out of news. And so we need to fix our eyes on Christ. This is no surprise to God. You know, we're surprised, but God is not surprised. And if you study the word of God, you know it shouldn't be a surprise to you either. These things are going to happen. They will happen. People depending on the world, depending on governments. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. He says that you keep, verse 14, this commandment without spot, blameless unto our Lord Jesus Christ, appearing, verse 15, which he will manifest in his own time, in his time. No one knows the day or the hour, only he knows. He who is blessed and the only potent, meaning sovereign. He's the only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords. That is the Jesus Christ we serve. There is none above him, none, none above God. No matter what their title is, kings, priests, in the past, present, and future, he is king of kings and lord of lords. And that's who we know him. He is our savior. And one day, every knee will bow and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it's best to call him Lord and Savior now than later on. Later on, it's going to be judgment time. It's too late. It's too late. Call him Lord and Savior now. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes this, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, speaking of Jesus, which is above every name, and that 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, everywhere. That's talking about the entire universe. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is Lord of Lord and King of and King of Kings. And again, very soon the world will know. Every king, every leader, every every president, every world leader would know that he is King of Kings, Lord of Lord. It tells us that at the end of the book. In Revelation, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, it says, And he, speaking of Jesus, has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I did not purposely put this in bold letters. That's how it's written in the Greek. In bold. In large caps. Verse 16, it says, Who alone has immortality? In other words, he's not subject to death. Jesus is not subject to death. He died, but he rose on the third day. Man is subject to death. One day, we all know our birthday. We know it very well. We celebrate it every year. But one day, there's going to be another date that is not your birthday. It's going to be the end of your life. And only God knows that day. Only God knows that day. We celebrate the birth, and that's great. And we mourn at the birth, at the, not at the end with the date. But that little dash in the middle that's on the tombstone is what's important. It would determine that what would happen when you're no longer alive, when your spirit leaves, leaves your body, when it goes before the Lord. We are subject to death, not the Lord. In fact, Jesus is not only uh, not subject to death, but he conquered death. When did he conquer death? When the tomb was empty. When he rose on the third day, which we're going to celebrate. Uh, well, we celebrate that every day. <laughs> but it's coming to that time in um, two months from now. He says, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Such light with which Christ surround himself in glory, that even, even the seraphims and the angels cannot, cannot look at at the Lord. You think about that. Heavenly eyes and the angels. Now angels got, Christ did not die for angels, okay? Angels have no soul. Christ died for you. That's why the angels, they study humanity. They study human. They're studying you. Why did Jesus, the creator who created me, is so worried about these people? They're blown away. But even the seraphims, even their eyes, when we get to heaven, we're going to have holy eyes. That's why you can't go to heaven in the flesh. You have to have a glorified body. Otherwise, you disintegrate if you stand before the Lord. You need, you need a body like Jesus. Remember when Jesus appeared to the disciples when they were hiding after Jesus rose from the grave? You know, the disciples thought that they were, after they crucified Jesus, they were gonna, the Roman soldiers were going to go after them. And so they boarded up the, the windows and the doors, and then all of a sudden, they're just waiting there, and then poof, there goes Jesus. <laughs> he didn't have to break through. He had a body, a glorified body that went through the physical material, the walls. That's the kind of body you and I are going to have. It's awesome. You want to go to Venus? There you are. When we get, but you got to make it to heaven first. It's a glorified body. And Jesus says, touch my body. He said, for it is flesh and bone. And when we say flesh, automatically we say flesh and blood. Jesus didn't have blood. Because his blood was poured out in Calvary. We're going to have the same body. It's going to be a glorified body. And I know many of us, just like me, if you're like me, when you wake up in the mirror, you want that body like now. <laughs> I want that body. You know, I have to step on a stool. Yeah, I'll look good and a foot tall. <laughs> right? We're going to have that kind of body. But when the seraphims in, in, in Isaiah chapter 6, remember when... when you know, King Uzziah died, and there Isaiah was like, wow, where do I look? And he said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And he saw seraphims. They had six wings, two that cover the feet, two to fly, and the other two was to cover the face. 
God was so holy that the seraphims with six wings would cover their eyes. The feet, to cover the feet, mean that they would humble themselves. And in the same way, this is the God that we serve. If we only knew, if we only saw Jesus on his throne, we see Jesus on his throne right now. That's why when John writes Revelation, you know, when he writes the book of Revelation, he, he realized, I, I felt as though I was dead when he saw the glorified Christ. When he saw the angel, he thought he was, uh, you know, something to be worshipped. He fell down. The angel wasn't an angel, actually. He said, hey, I'm a fellow servant like you. Don't bow down. Worship God. I like that song, If I Can Only Imagine. Because we always say, when I see God, especially to people who don't know God, they have no fear of God. It says, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell God, when you get to heaven, you're going to tell him nothing. You're going to fall flat on your face. They only know the glory and the power of God, but his eyes, we, we couldn't see him. And it says, to whom to be honor at the very end. He says, to whom be honor and everlasting power. It's a doxology, it's a praise. And then he says, amen, amen. Now we're going to look at verses 17 through 19, where Paul is going to uh, give, tell Timothy to command those who are wealthy, those who are well off, the considered rich that are in the church. You know, quite often when it comes to money, we always think the rich are the ones that are sinning. Uh, I disagree. I disagree. I say the poor actually sin more because the poor is going to want what the rich man has. The poor is the one that carelessly use their money to play lotto, have a dollar in a dream, and think they could be a millionaire. The poor are the ones that covered what the rich have, or not necessarily the rich, someone that has more. So we can covet. How many times we look at mansions and, wow, I wonder what it's like to live there. I used to do that, don't get me wrong. Now I'm looking at, wow, that's firewood. When Christ comes and brings judgment, wow. <laughs> All those are going to be left behind. Stay by that house. Why? Because there's a rich. No, no. That's going to be good wood to, fi- to keep you warm. They covet quite too often. Now Paul already condemned those who were attempting to, to, to be rich. Remember, those who wanted to be wealthy. We looked at that in our last study. And then look at verses 9 through 10. He said, but... Th- just move up to verses 9 and 10. It says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men into destruction and perdition. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This is not only for the rich. This is for the poor. The poor who desire to be rich and will give up anything to be rich. So it's not so much if you have or don't have. It's where your heart is. But here in the church of Ephesus, there are believers because he's writing to believers. He's not going to write this to unbelievers who are wealthy because what good would this scripture be to them? Remember the rich man who came to Jesus? Jesus, what must I do to follow the young rich ruler? Jesus says, well... Follow the commandments, right? He says, I followed them since I was a kid. He says, oh, you followed them? Well, give up all you have and follow me. He, the rich man left disappointed because he has so much. And he said he followed the commandments, but he actually broke the first one. He didn't even make it a second base. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. His God was money. And so here's the command, verse 17. He says, command those who are rich in, the, in this present age, and obviously it's applicable for us, do not be haughty. In other words, do, do not, don't be proud, don't be arrogant, don't be high-minded. He says, nor to trust in uncertain riches. You can't trust money, no matter how good you are with it. No matter how a smart investor you are. People lose money. So many people have lost, even committed suicide, stockbrokers, because their investment is gone. Can't put trust in money. Whether it's a penny 
or a zillion dollars. Don't trust in it. Riches are uncertain. It's forever changing. You've been forever losing it, whether it's stolen, whether it's been swindled, or you've been sued for it. It fades away. Do not trust in uncertain riches. Here's a couple of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 28 says, Trust in your money, and down you go. I'm giving it to you from the New Living Translation, by the way. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. Here's another one, Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. It says, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. How many people do that? How many times you have to do overtime just to get rich? How many times you became a workaholic? You left your family, your marriage is on the rocks, and you don't know where, you, where your kids are. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears for it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. It's important to, you know, I, I praise God for conviction by the Holy Spirit. And I praise God that I, in, in, in my career as a police officer, I, you know, there was so much overtime. But I was never one to be known to take the overtime. Uh, people would say, Panero, why are you not? It's easy money. You're just going to stand in a parade and look the parade go down. It's easy money. It's, eh. I, I like to be at church. I like to be home with my family. Always putting it down. When they would order me, okay, I got to be ordered. I could easily find somebody who will come to me. Hey, Panero, did you order you? I'll take it. <laughs> sure, take it. I'd rather be home. I'd rather be in ministry. Because... The more you want, the more you keep wanting. You know, Jesus spoke about the foolish rich man. He gave a parable in Luke chapter 12. The rich man said, well, you know, I'm going to build greater barns. Do you remember that? I'm going to build greater barns and store all my crops and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, once I've done all, I will say to my soul, I have many goods laid up for me for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. At the end of that proverb, Jesus says, in Luke chapter 12, verses 20 to 21, Jesus says, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Money is not certain. Don't place your trust in money. You will lose sleep. You will even lose your, your family. Your marriage will be destroyed. Put your faith in God. God will supply some of your needs. No. The Bible says you will supply all your needs. Not wants. Wanting a mansion is not a want. It's not a need. It's a want. It's not a need. You supply all your needs. He says at the end, he said, but in trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Trust in the living God who's alive. He's real. Who gives us richly all things to enjoy. We know money can't buy you love, right? It can't buy you happiness. It can't buy you, it can't buy you time. But focus. Put your trust in the living God. He gives all your needs for enjoyment. So you don't have to worry about time. You don't have to worry about time. Save your money. You don't have to worry about time because God gives time. He created time. And we serve him. He's an eternal God. And so with him, you have all the time in the world because when you die, you shall live as a believer in Jesus Christ. You don't have to worry about buying love because we worship and serve the one who is love. And he gives unconditionally. He is love. You don't have to worry about buying happiness. Now, happiness, again, is temporary. It's based on circumstances. You could be happy you got a raise, but then be sad when you lose it. But we have joy and happiness through him, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, it says, Let them do good that they 
Be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. You know, it's God who willed those who are doing well financially. It was God's will. It was God who gives. It is not your talent. It's not because of your great looks. It's not because of your degree. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it is God's will that you have what you have. There was a man who uh, gave his testimony in a service once, and he gave his testimony how once he was poor, but God gave him a million dollars, so he became a millionaire. And as he was sharing how, he, uh, how the Lord uh, blessed him with a million dollars when he was poor, and now he's rich, at the very end of the service, this old lady went up to him with a crooked finger, and it says, young man, God gave you that million dollars, but are you willing to give it back? Are you willing to give it back to God? John Wesley, he made this statement. This is what he lived by. He says, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And that should be for all of us, whether you have or don't have. You know, when you don't have, and you give all that you have. Now listen, this is, you already know, how many, if you've been with us for almost 10 years, you know I'm not a prosperity preacher teacher, okay? And so, but this, this is where we're dealing it. This is why I talk about it. Because it's here. It talks about money. We're, we're to give, even when we don't have I used to use wisdom. If you only have $20 in the bank, you know, and you have put food on the table for your kids, you know, God's not going to say, well, you know, you're going to give up that $20. Use wisdom. But give with a cheerful heart. Give willingly. The lady who had the two widow mind, you know, and, and in that time, in that culture, you know, they would have this container where they would actually, uh, you know, put the money, these coins in this box. And those that wanted to show off that they gave so much, they got the biggest coins because that's going to make the most noise. And they'll take this big half dollar, put it in there, boom. Oh, wow, that guy gave a lot of money. Nobody wanted to give the widow money. You know, because that doesn't make that much noise. And they would, they would blow the trumpets. Hey, everybody, look what I'm giving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that's who I am. God loves me. God needs help in heaven, you know. There are people like that. And they have their own ways of doing it. The Bible says, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. Don't even announce it to Pastor Eddie. As it come, I don't know, $50 brother for $500 brother. I don't know who gives. I know the finances of the church, bills we have to pay. I don't know who gives. It's between you and the Lord. Let's come in and pass the plate around. Because the one with the biggest bill will raise it up higher. The one with the lowest bill will go straight from the pocket, right, keep it down, down low and nobody can see it into the, it's between you and the Lord. That's why we don't pass the plate around. That's why it's in the back. It's between you and the Lord. But give. So we're to give. If you, you truly have, he said, you want to be rich. Be rich in this. Uh, good works. Ready to give. Willing to share. The more, the more you have, the more you hold, the less you will have. The more you hold, the less you will be trusted with. And there are, there are godly people. There are Christians who are wealthy. Smart men. And the reason why they're wealthy is because God can trust them with the wealth. How many people say, well, Lord, if I could, Lord, if, if I win the lottery, Lord, I'm going to give you half. Let me win the lottery. Yeah, right. You won't even give a penny. You won't even help. Me. Forget it. By the time the IRS get after you and you pay for your in-laws, the outlaws, whatever laws, and you, you have nothing left. God knows your heart. You're not going to share. You're not going to give it to anyone. God knows who you can trust with. But he knows the heart. Remember, we, we studied that in our last study. How learn, Paul said, to be content is something we must learn. We have to learn it. Verse 19, it says, storing up for themselves a good foundation 
for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. This is the good work. So you want to be rich in this? Give. Be ready to give so that it will be stored. You lay yourself a good foundation. There is an old saying. It goes like this. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead through giving, through blessing. Because God knows, look, you cannot give God. I, there were times when we had, Judy and I, we had nothing. We struggled. And you know, we remain faithful. Remain faithful. Even to this day, if, 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 I, if the scripture calls us to give tithe and offering, Pastor Eddie gives tithes and offerings too. And if you're one that tithes, and I always open it up. Do you want to see if I tithe? And I don't care. You can see how much I tithe if you want. But you better be one that gives. If you don't give, don't be looking at my tithing offering. But then again, I don't want you to see what I give. I lose my reward in heaven. The point is that I too give because I believe and I trust in the Lord. I don't depend and hold my money. Now, Paul's coming to a close here, verses 20 and 21, but he closes with a warning and he's telling Timothy, listen, guard your heart, Timothy. Timothy, he opened up his letter. He said to beloved, he, he considered a beloved son of the faith. He was like a son to him. So look what he says in verse 20. He says, oh, Timothy, the O." Oh. He said, oh, Timothy, it reflects Paul's emotional appeal to Timothy. Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Guard it. God is giving you a talent, a gift. He's giving you a ministry. Guard it. Guard the faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight for it. Guard it. Guard your heart. Guard your faith. Guard the calling in your life, your ministry. Guard the truth revealed in the letter. In this letter, guard the word of God. Keep it to your heart. He said, avoid the profane and idle babbling and contradiction of what is falsely called knowledge. These false teachers think they have great superior wisdom, and they don't. It speaks nothing of the doctrine. It speaks nothing of Christ. Verse 21, he said, by professing it, some have strayed concerning their faith. Sadly, some have uh, professed Christ and have been taken away by these false doctrines. That's the reason why it's here. Is it still happening today? Absolutely. It happens in every church, and it's happening to the churches today. People follow other people, not following Christ. And in a lot of things, in false doctrines and whatever it is, by professing that some have strayed concerning the faith, grace be with you, and all God's people say, amen. amen. Grace. He ends with grace because that's how the book started. It started with grace. Now, saints, now that we've studied 1 Timothy, all six chapters, now you know when it comes to matters of the church, the qualification of a deacon, elder leadership, how a church ought to conduct itself. Forget about tradition and all these denominations and all these religions. Look at what the, the book of 1 Timothy has to say about it concerning church leadership. Uh, it's there in the scripture. Now you know where to go. So we finish 1 Timothy. The next time together, where we're going to begin? 2 Timothy with chapter First, excellent, you're good. You know, you guys are great. You deserve a meal, matter of fact. After this, not just kidding. <laughs> Don't forget, um, we're going to start 2 Timothy. Go ahead and read some of those chapters. Get an idea, read the book, get to know it. Um, and, and don't forget to see Pastor John if you're interested in serving in ministry. Um, again, if it's a worship team, you have a talent, you could play guitar, piano, uh, come see me. And don't forget to sign up for Galentines, okay? Um, girls ages 13 and 19. Pastor John also has a Bible study on Fridays. You can see Pastor John about that as well. So that is it. Let us stand. Let us now uh, pray for the Lord to bless the food and importantly the fellowship. Now again, instructions just to help the flow of traffic here. If you're not staying, we hope you would stay. Even if you can eat and run, it's okay. Pastor Eddie says it's okay to eat and run. But if you have to leave and go directly to your car, the rear door at the sanctuary, you can exit that way, okay? 
narrows the, not just kidding, I was going to throw that one again, narrows the gate to the agape, not just kidding, if you are here for the agape fellowship, please uh, let's get that flow going, okay, uh, and that's the, the door at the rear, okay, let us pray, Lord, we thank you for your word that never perishes, Lord, now we just pray that we live and we guard it, Lord, we guard it, we fight the good fight of faith, Lord, yeah. be with us, Lord, we thank you for being with us, uh, throughout the study of uh, 1 Timothy. And Lord, we just pray, should you tarry, Lord, when we get back together, we will study 2 Timothy. We pray ahead, Lord. This, I know there's so much that we can learn from that book. But Lord, your word is alive. It never returns back to your void. It doesn't hit the ground. It, it, it ministers to us. It changes our lives, the way we think, the way we live, the way we love one another. Now, Lord, we pray for the food. Uh, we pray you bless the hands who prepared it. Uh, and it may be nourishing to our bodies, Lord, as your word is nourishing to our lives, our soul, Lord. Uh, now and also we ask that you bless our time of fellowship. May we meet new people, faces we never saw or talked with people we never talked with before as we break bread. We love you, Lord. It's called agape fellowship because it's the love of Jesus. This konania, we have one thing in common, Jesus Christ. Be with us, Lord, we ask. In your name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. May the Lord be with you. Have a blessed day.